Hello again, everyone. Happy Friday. It's good that we can get together once again to learn more about the Word of God. Specifically, in this series of Bible studies, we're looking into the life and times of Queen Esther, queen of 127 provinces under the rule of King Darius, the great Artaxerxes. And of course, Esther's cousin Mordecai is also an integral part of the story. Last week, we left off at the close of chapter 3. Haman's edict to kill the Jews in all the provinces had been approved by the king and the royal messengers have all been sent out to inform all the residents throughout the empire. The Persian Empire was quite large and it's difficult to know how, it would have, how long it would have taken to get the news out of this edict out to all the provinces. It spread out over thousands of miles. There's probably a map in the back of your Bible of the Persian Empire, but if not, you can just Google some images of Persia to get an idea of how large it was. To the west, it extended all the way to Libya, and to the east, it went well into India and went as far north as the Black Sea. It went as far south as the Persian Gulf and the Arabian Sea. And we might tend to forget that Jerusalem and Judea were provinces of Persia as well. They weren't independent, and that's one of the reasons uh, King Cyrus and Darius took responsibility for the safety and security of all who went up there to resettle and rebuild the temple and Nehemiah's wall. They were under control of Persia. In fact, after they were taken captive by the Babylonians, Judea never did regain independence again until 1948. So, with that in mind, the king's edict to slaughter the Jews was an order that would have gone to the people uh, living in Jerusalem as well, even though it's not mentioned, to my knowledge, anywhere else in the Bible. As we proceed to chapter 4, the spiritual storm clouds are forming all around the empire, and what must be brewing is a titanic spiritual battle, the likes of which we can't even imagine. But no one can see it. Okay, let's begin reading chapter 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. When Mordecai learned of all that had been done, he tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the city, wailing loudly and bitterly. As hateful as Haman was, he probably made it a point to let Mordecai be among the first to find out about his plan, and Mordecai reacted as one would expect. Verse 2, But he went only as far as the king's gate, because no one clothed in sackcloth was allowed to enter it. Tearing one's clothes is, is an expression we see throughout the Bible, and especially in the Old Testament. It was a custom long ago among the Israelites, but it was also a custom uh, in Persia. I'm sure this was a spontaneous act in light of the gravity of the situation, and as was his loud wailing. After all, it's not every day you find out your government plans on killing you. But he may also have been trying to get Esther's attention to let her know what was going on, and she, being the queen, might be able to put a stop to all this. But he could only go so far because mourners weren't allowed within the palace gates. The palace was a happy place, you see. Being sad, depressed, or mournful in the king's presence could even get you killed. So, spontaneous or not, he was making a commotion in hopes someone would let Esther know something was dreadfully wrong with Mordecai. Verse 3. In every province to which the edict and order of the king came, there was great mourning among the Jews. With fasting, weeping, and wailing, many lay in sackcloth and ashes. When Esther's eunuchs and female attendants came and told her about Mordecai, she was in great distress. She sent clothes for him to put on instead of his sackcloth, but he would not accept them. 
Then Esther summoned Hathak, one of the king's eunuchs, assigned to attend to her, and ordered him to find out what was troubling Mordecai and, and why. Verse 6, So Hathak went out to Mordecai in the open square of the city in front of the king's gate. Mordecai told him everything that had happened to him, including the exact amount of money Haman had promised to pay into the royal treasury for the destruction of the Jews. Now this verse indicates to me that Mordecai knew more about Haman's murderous plot than, than was on the official edict that was posted in all the provinces. He knew that Haman was going to pay the royal treasury a huge amount of money out of his personal fortune, and that wouldn't have been on the official edict because we know the king told Haman to keep his money. Mordecai hadn't heard that yet. Verse 8. He, gave him, he also gave him a copy of the text of the edict for their annihilation, which had been published in Susa, to show Esther and explain it to her, and he, and he told him to instruct her to go into the king's presence to beg for mercy and plead with him for her people. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, and now notice what Esther said. This was her initial response to Mordecai. Verse 11. All the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law that they be put to death unless the king extends the gold scepter to them and spares their lives. But thirty days have passed since I was called to go to the king. Now, even though Esther was the queen, she couldn't just walk in on her husband to, to say hi and have a little chat. She couldn't see him for any reason unless he called for her. Because it was the law of the land or at least the law of the palace. And she hadn't seen him or been called by him in, in 30 days. So she didn't know if he was mad at her or tired of her or what all was going on with him. So her first reaction to Mordecai was, I can't approach the king about this. I could be killed. And she may have thought about how wonderful she had it, being the queen of the wealthiest and most powerful empire on earth. She was living a dream, a life of luxury. She was living in a palatial estate with every imaginable whim at her beck and call. She was the queen of Persia and had everything to lose. But would the king even receive her if she came into his inner court? Esther may have had real doubts about her relationship with her husband, the king. Did her feminine intuition cause her to wonder if the king really loved her? Or was she just a figurehead for official functions? She may have been pestered with the thought of how she could compete for the king's affection when she had so many rivals to contend with in his sprawling harem of virgins and concubines. She may have lamented that the king had lost interest in her. Verse 12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place, but you and your father's family will perish. And who knows whether you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. There's that often quoted verse that's been used in many situations by many different people. Who knows what you are here for, for such a time as this? If Esther entertained thoughts of not doing anything in order to keep her cushy position, those thoughts didn't last long. And Esther's reply to Mordecai was exactly what needed to be done in this situation. Verse 15. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa, and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, 
even though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. If I die, I die. Those who have, have observed that this book of Esther doesn't mention God are correct when it comes to the letter of the law. There is no mention of God. But when you, when you consider the depth of understanding Esther and Mordecai had when it came to combating evil, the evidence of God in his presence are everywhere. Verse 17. So Mordecai went away and carried out all of Esther's instructions. Esther and all of her attendants and Mordecai, along with all the Jews in Susa, began a three-day fast, and this was a full fast with no food or anything to drink. And because it involved a group or, or groups of people, we would call this a corporate fast in today's parlance. Stop and think how many people this might have included. Esther's retinue might have involved considerably more than a handful of maids, she may have had upwards of 40 or 50 or even more servants participating with her. And we don't have any idea how many Jews resided in Susa. There could have been hundreds or even thousands in the city. Regardless, this three-day fast was a big deal. When commentaries, or at least some commentaries, look at the book of Esther to determine its purpose in the scope of the Bible, the general consensus is that the book serves to show what God's relationship was like with the remnant of the Jews who remained in Babylon or Persia after the 70-year captivity was over. Some of the people may have chosen to stay because they might have been become established with their farms or businesses, and others may have desired to return to Jerusalem but couldn't afford it or were unable to travel that far because of their age or what have you. They were, they were the remnant who were scattered throughout the Persian Empire, and I'm not sure if anyone really knows how many of them there were. There may be a record or census somewhere that, with that information, but I'm not aware of it. The Matthew Henry concise commentary has this to say, quote, We find in this book that even those Jews who were scattered in the province of the heathen were taken care of, and were wonderfully preserved when threatened with destruction. Though the name of God may not be in this book, the finger of God is shown by minute events for the bringing about his people's deliverance. This history comes in between Ezra chapters 6 and 7. End quote. I'd like to add a parenthetical thought here, and that's this. I agree with Matthew Henry's observation that the book of Esther, or at least a portion of it, falls in line with the time of the book of Ezra. The temple was dedicated the same year Ezra went to Jerusalem, which was in 515 BC, and that was the same year Esther became queen. That's just an aside that may have fit better somewhere else in the study, but I thought I'd throw it out there. And this would be a good place to insert a quick little break. So let's do that and check in with the voice of East Texas, Gary Gibbons. You already know that biblical prophecy can be hard to understand. What you may not know is that without a grasp of history, it is next to impossible. Write for a free introductory program in our series on history and prophecy. It will open up a whole new world of Bible study. Write to Born to Win, Post Office Box 560, White House, Texas 75791. Or call toll free 1-888-BIBLE-44. Thank you, Gary. Always good to hear you. Okay, there are a lot of things going on in this chapter. The things that we can see are obvious, and then there are the things going on that we can't see. And those are the spiritual machinations of the dark side. We can probably all agree with the Bible commentaries that this historical book shows the intimate relationship God had with his people after the captivity. We see how his intricate and well-woven miracles transpired for the good of all his people in Persia, including Esther and Mordecai. And it's good that we understand that. But as we move on with our lives well into the 21st century, it would behoove us 
to look at this book of Esther in a more pragmatic manner regarding the effect it could and should have on our lives. We have a lot in common with what was going on with Esther and Mordecai, more than you might have ever imagined. Mordecai and Esther were blindsided with what happened to them. They didn't see anything coming. Mordecai was doing all right as a royal gatekeeper, and it was a respectable job, and he didn't appear to have any complaints. And certainly, Esther must have settled in quite nicely to her majestic lifestyle. Life was sweet. What could possibly go wrong? They didn't see the demoniacal clouds swirling around, and they didn't see the spiritual infernos blazing all around them. They didn't see anything to warn them of the impending doom. They may not even have known what spiritual warfare was all about. They probably weren't privy to the writings of Daniel where he, he wrote about the prince of Persia who kept Gabriel engaged in an otherworldly battle for three weeks. Then, without warning, when everything came crashing down on them, how did they respond? Surely they must have been afraid, probably terrified, mortified. But did they panic? Maybe a little. Who could have blamed them if they did? What were their options? How could they have fought the king's edict? God wouldn't allow his people to be destroyed, they could have reasoned. They didn't have any power to go against Haman, the second most powerful man in the kingdom. Besides, it was the king who gave his royal approval to have all the Jews killed. They could have resigned themselves to not get actively involved in this. They could have just turned it over to God and let him work this out. After all, he's the one in charge. Is that what they did? No, they did exactly the right thing. Even when they had no warning, they had no idea they, they were standing in the middle of a massive spiritual battleground. There may have been legions upon legions of fiendish demons hovering all around them, just waiting to attack. But Mordecai, Esther, and the rest of the Jews may not have detected anything like that because they probably weren't aware of the concept of spiritual warfare. But we are familiar with the concept of spiritual warfare. So, that being the case, what are we doing to combat the very real spiritual battles that are happening all around us? We have a huge advantage over Mordecai and Esther. They were taken by surprise, but we know who the enemy is in advance. And identifying the, the enemy is half the battle. Are we making use of that knowledge? What are we doing to prepare for the spiritual battles that come, and what are we doing about the spiritual entanglements we may already be involved in? As I record this edition of the Weekend Bible Study, January is coming to a close, and we've just inaugurated Donald Trump as our 45th President of the United States. Were you aware that hundreds of thousands of people in this country and around the world have recently completed a 21-day Daniel-styled fast? It's true. It's an annual event that happens every January, and the event grows larger each year. People of every faith are involved, and this year many of those people were praying for our country and, and for the election in hopes America might see a spiritual revival of some sort which would put this nation on a more godly track, which, in turn, might lead us in a positive direction more apt to promote life, liberty, and justice, and the rule of law is prescribed by God and our Constitution. Furthermore, there were large prayer rallies in every state in the last six months leading up to the election. All of these prayer warriors we're crying out to God in hopes our nation would turn back to God, as we're admonished to do in that very well-known verse. Second Chronicles 7.14 You know that verse by heart, I bet. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear them from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. 
When Mordecai found out about Haman's plan and the king's edict to kill the Jews, we're told in first one, he tore his clothes. That was the custom back then. And in the King James Version, it says he rent his clothes, which it's an old-timey word for rend or cut away. There's a beautiful passage in Joel that expands on this ancient custom of tearing one's clothes. It's in Joel 2, verses 12 through 14. Let's go back and read it. Joel 2, 12. Even now, declares the Lord, Return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings for the Lord your God. There it is. That sums up what our battle plan should be for our, the spiritual battles that are constantly all around us. God wants us to rend our hearts, not our clothing, and turn back to Him. Mordecai and Esther did exactly the right things to combat the spiritual war that was going to literally destroy them. In any battle, in every war, you need strategic weaponry. You need weapons that are capable of completely taking out the enemy. Well, fasting and prayer are the heavy artillery of spiritual warfare. And there are countless examples of our Bible heroes who cried out to God in powerful prayers while they were fasting. Do a search for the words fast or fasted or fasting in your concordance or on your digital Bible and you'll see how many times the great people of the Bible fasted. Fasting is one of the most powerful spiritual tools we have and it's amazing how few Christians utilize it on a regular basis. In the book of Matthew, Jesus gave real clear instructions on several important things we need to be doing as Christians. He wasn't making suggestions, but rather some pretty bold directives to his disciples. In Matthew 6, he said, When you give, when you pray, and when you fast. He didn't say, if you give, if you pray, or if you fast. The implication here is, it needs to be done on a regular basis, just like praying and charitable giving. This past week, I heard an, an inspiring speech by retired General William G. Boykin, who's better known as Jerry Boykin. And maybe you've seen him on TV. Boykin was one of the elite warriors chosen in, in 1978 to make up the first unit in what was then the classified and deadly Delta Force. He then became commander of the unit and ultimately became the commander of all U.S. Army Special Forces. The speech I heard was titled, The Courage of a Warrior. And I'm sure you could find it up at YouTube. It's well worth watching or hearing, and I encourage you to do that. In the speech, he related some of his captivating war stories, of course, but the thrust of his speech was geared to Christian warriors and how vital it is for Christians to be courageous. He emphasized the fact that courage was in short supply in our Christian lives and in our churches. He pointed out that many Christians and church pastors are content to sit back and let God take care of everything because, well, he's in charge and he's calling the shots. Well, of course God's in charge. But that doesn't mean we don't have to do anything. It doesn't take courage to not do anything. Boykin opined and lamented that some churches are even afraid to take a stand on matters as basic as the pro-life movement for fear of appearing to be too political. Now, what again is political about standing up for the life of innocent unborn babies? He then quoted a passage in Psalms that you might associate with a warrior like Boykin. 
The passage is in Psalm 94. Psalm 94, beginning in verse 16. Who will rise up for me against the wicked? Who will take a stand for me against evildoers? Unless the Lord has had given me help, I would soon have dwelt in the silence of death. When I said, My foot is slipping, your unfailing love, Lord, supported me. When anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. Can a corrupt throne be allied with you, a throne that brings on misery by its decrees? The wicked band together against the righteous and condemn the innocent to death. But the Lord has become my fortress, and my God the rock in whom I take refuge. He will repay them for their sins, and destroy them for their wickedness. The Lord our God will destroy them. Boykin stressed the need for moral courage in the church, and to stand up against the evil that's all around us. We need to rise up against the wicked, and fight back like the Christian soldiers we've sung about so many times. We can't just sit back passively and do nothing. We're in a war against evil, and we have to do our part. Remember that famous quote attributed to Dietrich Bonhoeffer in Nazi Germany? It goes something like this. Silence in the face of evil is itself evil. The context of that quote was regarding the silence of the churches, and Christians in Germany when they might have been able to stop Hitler before life in Germany got out of hand. And there's another thing to consider, and it's a big consideration. Remember the parable of the the talents? I won't read through it now, but if you'd like to refresh your memory, you can read that parable in Matthew 25. What if that parable applies to how well we fight in this spiritual war? And if we're not using the spiritual weapons of war we have access to, nearly as often as we need to be using them, we have access to a spiritual armory that can defeat the demoniacal hordes. And always remember that one plus the Holy Spirit is a majority, and Satan is well aware of that fact. Are we doing our part? Are we taking a stand against evil that envelops our society? Are we fighting back, or are we spiritual cowards? You don't have to go there now, but jot down Revelation 21.8. Revelation 21.8, and read it sometime. Cowards are the first to be mentioned of those who will be thrown into the lake of fire. I don't want to be a coward. Are we the isolated church of God that is fearfully hiding from society? Or are we the courageous church of God who boldly rises up against the wicked? Remember, we're told 365 times in the Bible to not fear or be afraid. When we fast on a regular basis, we get closer to God and Jesus. And the closer we are to Him or them, the more intimate we'll become with them and the less fearful we'll be because we'll be experiencing their power more and more in our lives. Mordecai and Esther, they got it. They might not have understood the concept of spiritual warfare, but they knew they desperately needed God's intervention in their lives. And Esther knew what what she had to do. When she approached the king, She fully grasped the possibility that she might be killed for entering the king's court uninvited. She would do what she had to do, and if she died, she died. Daniel came to that realization, too, when he faced the lion's den. He faced the lion's den for continuing in prayer three times each day after it had been declared against the law. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego also knew they'd be killed if God didn't intervene in their situation. Are we there yet? Are we willing to put ourselves out there, letting our light shine for all to see, in a dark world that's rapidly beginning to hate the light? And at some point, it may become illegal to be a Christian. It's already illegal in many Muslim countries. And even here at home in the good old USA, Christianity is 
considered to be a hateful religion by many extreme leftists. And at some point, some may seek to kill us for how we live our lives. Are we ready to say, if I die, I die? Chapter 5 opens up on the third day of Esther's fast, and she courageously approached the king's inner court. Matthew Henry's concise commentary has a rather eloquent statement about this time in Esther's life, and I'd like to read that. Esther, having had power with God and prevailing like Jacob, had power with men too. He that loses his life for God shall save it, or find it in a better life. The king encouraged her, Let us from this be encouraged to pray always to our God, and not to faint. Esther came to a proud, imperious man, but we come to the God of love and grace. He, she was not called, but we are. The Spirit says, Come, and the Bride says, Come. She had a law against her. We have a promise, many a promise, in favor of us. Ask, and it shall be given you. She had no friend to go with her or to plead for her. On the contrary, he that was then the king's favorite was her enemy. But we have an advocate with the Father, in whom he is well pleased. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. God put it into Esther's heart to delay her petition a day longer. She knew not, but God did, what was to happen in that very night. End quote. Next week we'll begin chapter 5. But this is a logical stopping point for tonight's study. We talked a lot about spiritual warfare tonight, and it would probably be a good idea to read Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 10, when you get a chance. That's the chapter that covers the full armor of God, and it's essential that we be thoroughly familiar with these spiritual defenses, so we'll be prepared when we engage the enemy. But the armor isn't all for self-defense. One of the most important items mentioned is the all-important sword. Gotta go right now, but please come back again next week as we continue this study on Esther and Mordecai and the other interesting characters in this special book. Send me an email at richg at borntowin.net and be sure to have a wonderful week. Good night, everyone. Hope to see you again next week.